Welcome friends to another r slash pro revenge video. Today we've got some hard hitting revenge stories and our first story of the day is from Classy Pyro. I hope you enjoy failing your final college class and having to retake it. During my stay in college and for a few years after graduation, I had a side hustle where I charged people a small amount of money to format their academic papers according to our national standards as set by our national association of technical norms. On top of that, I would also write an abstract in a foreign language, English, and even get your bibliographical references up to snuff. It wasn't much, $60 got your paper formatted as it should be, $80 got your references properly inserted from scratch, and $100 got you the whole thing with a carefully written abstract. It wasn't much even in our local currency, especially considering that there are people who do this full time and charge an arm and a leg for it. However, that also includes proofreading, but a slower turnout time. This means that it's normal for people to hire those services months or weeks in advance from the deadline for turning in your papers. This story set in late 2017. I had just left my job and meanwhile I was formatting academic work almost full time since it was the end of the semester. This was a particularly busy semester since if you do good work, people will refer you to their friend who will refer you to their other friend and so forth. Word of mouth really does work. Somehow, I was recently being looked up by a lot of people in one specific course in the healthcare area. Now, I don't particularly like formatting papers from people in healthcare for a few particular reasons, but hey, you're not going to turn away honest pay for honest work if you're unemployed. In any case, they all seemed to be in the same class because the deadline was the same. December 9th, 8pm, and not a second longer. The night before, I was enjoying a cold beer and I was messaged by an unknown number who said they got my contact from so and so that spoke highly of my work. When she mentioned to me that she needed me to format her paper, I said I don't take on any new work the day before it's due because that always ends in complications for me. Well, she pleaded, nay, begged me to do it, said she would pay me a little over my usual rate and that she's good for it. Scout's honor. I sighed before I replied, okay, fine, but I'm only sending you your paper once the payment goes through, okay? Instantly she replied, yes, oh my god, thanks. A few minutes later, I had what had to be the worst paper of the semester in my files. Whoever wrote it took no care or had no idea how to team Microsoft Word. It was all over the place, with different fonts, spacing, a few things outlined. I began regretting this already. But no backing out now. I put on some music and cracked out my whip and began taming that vile beast of a paper. And four hours later, it was done. What had once been a literary work equivalent of an orc was now a proper formatted, neatly organized academic paper. I messaged her, the work is done, I'm awaiting payment, and went to sleep. I woke up around midday to see she had replied with a picture of a receipt for a bank deposit made through an ATM to my account, in the amount that was agreed. Normally this would be it, but the problem was that it was made at really early in the morning, so the bank hadn't processed it yet. I logged into my bank account, and sure enough, the amount was there, but as pending verification, I messaged her to let her know that she would have her paper as soon as the bank verified and cleared the funds. To my surprise, she replied that she needed the paper now, as she was meeting with her professor one last time to make sure everything was good. Now, I've had to deal with this before, and let's just say I've already learned my lesson, so I wasn't risking getting stiffed. Well, we had some back and forth for a while as expected, saying she was good for it and can I please send the paper now? K thanks, bye. I might have sent it if I knew her, which I didn't. And the person who referred her to me was someone who had been referred by someone else who, you get the idea. At that moment, I got a hunch that the funds wouldn't clear and, wouldn't you know it, around 3.30 p.m., after getting barraged with a ton of messages, I checked my bank statement, the deposit had been cancelled by the bank with the reason, empty envelope. Dramatic gasp. At that moment, I was a bit aggravated at myself for not following my own rule of not taking up work that's due the next day. Oh well. I messaged her a picture after scrubbing out my bank balance and told her that I would not be sending her the paper. A few moments later, I got a phone call and she was panicked saying she swore that she had put the money in the envelope and into the ATM. 
that it must have been the bank's fault and that she was going to deposit it right now and could I please send her the file? I told her I was only going to send her the file if she met up and paid me in cash. To which she made up thousands of excuses as to why she couldn't meet up today. Oh well, it's not my deadline. Around 7.20pm, I was being barraged with messages and a few phone calls, to which I ignored. The call stopped at 8.30pm, long after the deadline. Surprisingly, a few days later, when I was out running some errands, I ran into one of my other clients, who casually asked me if I'd taken on work from so-and-so and if something happened. I said I did and asked why. Well, she told me so-and-so blasted me to pretty much all of her classmates as being a charlatan and a thief because, according to her, I took the money up front, vanished with no paper trail, and because she missed the deadline to turn in her paper, she had failed the class and would have to retake it next semester. Ouch. I hope that money she stiffed me on helped soften the cost of having to retake that class, as it would cost her that amount several times over. But hey, a lesson in honesty and good faith has no price, right? Well, OP might not have stuck to the rule of not taking work the day before it's due, but at least OP stuck to the rule of not sending the file over until they're sure the money cleared. If you're in a situation like this where somebody's asking you to please send something over and they'll pay you back later, and you're pretty sure they probably won't pay you unless you get it up front, are you good at putting your foot down and saying straight up no, or would you say you're a little susceptible to giving into that pressure? Let me know what you guys think in the comments down below. Our next story is from Redeemer89, Pedantic Manager Picks Apart Their Own Work. I worked for a high street retail chain that, in their infinite wisdom, ditched the store manager position and instead had four assistant managers running a store. This led to intensive workplace politics, as the more competitive staff kept trying to pull stuff to make out that they were the big dog, despite the fact that we were all on the same level. Setting the scene, our area manager asked each of us to produce a weekly rota, so that between us we would have a month's worth of rotas prepared. The most pedantic, least liked, and most determined to be the big dog assistant manager took this as their 9 billionth opportunity to try to pick apart our work to satisfy their superiority complex and criticize our work to make out like they were managing the managers. Pretty sick of the constant, unnecessary workplace politics, I decided to bring them down a peg or two. I found every excuse to delay producing my rota until I knew that everyone had finished doing theirs. The pedantic assistant manager badgered me all week, again trying to manage someone at the same level for extra superiority points. Cue the revenge, on the last day before we were due to submit, all the assistant managers were in, so I took the opportunity to make my own rota from scratch. Having finished it, I saved it and then produced a second rota to set a trap for my micromanaging colleague. Basically, I copied and pasted their rota so it was an exact replica of theirs. I then let the two other fed up assistant managers know what I've done so they can enjoy the imminent spectacle. That lunch, it came time for us to all compare rotas and with the usual predictability, have our rotas picked apart by our pettiest of colleagues. They went first, to assert misplaced dominance. Everything seemed fine, so we moved on to the next one. The next rota came out, and although it was perfectly fine, it was criticized left, right, and center by the usual culprit. The next rota came out, and again, despite being a perfectly acceptable rota, needed tweaking, critiquing, and changing to meet our annoying colleagues' faux higher standards. Finally, we come to my rota. I open up the spreadsheet with the copied rota, and lo and behold, it's not good enough. After a solid 5 minutes of them criticizing their own rota, with my colleagues and I increasingly beaming as we feed off the pure schadenfreude energy, I explain that I found it interesting that there are so many mistakes with mine when it's exactly the same as the first rota we all looked at. This prompts our colleague to quickly flit back and forth between the two rotas going an increasingly obvious shade of beetroot before feigning outrage that I just copied their work, for which I'm going to get reported. At this point I highlight that this won't be necessary, as I bring up my real rota and then announce I'm going back to the shop floor. My two grinning colleagues do the same, leaving the final petty assistant manager alone to fully soak in the petty revenge they've just been served with. 
I don't think there's anything more satisfying than exactly what OP just displayed here. Literally exposing this person for some judging, tearing down whoever they can, hypocritical person whose only priority is tearing down everybody else and trying to make themselves look fantastic. That sure is interesting considering you just tore apart literally your own work. That is so satisfying. By the way, if you're enjoying these stories, make sure to hit those like and subscribe buttons down below so you never miss any of my daily videos. This next story is from Responsible Hat 2266 Revenge on Noisy Neighbors. Back when I finished high school, I got a job in a town away from home. I got two other girls who were colleagues and we rented a room. Our neighbors were three university students. Two of them were inconsiderate and would make noise past midnight and we could hear everything through the walls. We requested them to reduce the noise several times, but they sarcastically told us to deal with it, that they paid their rent and were free to do whatsoever. One day, I overheard one of them complaining of a headache and that he needed to sleep. Cue to me waking up my roommates, we started telling stories and laughing out loudly. The guy told us to shut it off, but I shouted through the walls, but we paid our rent last week. Suffice to say, we never dealt with the noise ever again. Sometimes, the best way to deal with people is just showing them by means of mirroring their actions or by maybe showing a video of themselves before they realize, you know what, maybe I should reconsider my actions. Our next story is from Cleopatra. Friend kicked me out during my first month in Berlin. A close friend, female 30, took me in because we agreed to split rent. I, female 25, just moved to Berlin to start my masters. She stole my tobacco, and when I called her out, she escalated irrationally. She kicked me out the following month for someone who could pay more. I had noticed so many red flags when I arrived. I'd paid rent for the month, so there's nothing she could do. She basically threw me out in a foreign city with a housing crisis. She took the building and the apartment key, so I was basically imprisoned at home the whole time, and went to her boyfriend's and claimed she must have lost it plain lie, I have proof. The idiot forgot the key to the room door inside the lock. So on my way out, guess you locked the room and lost the key as well. Oh, I might have forgotten the heater on. Oh, she'll only be back in a week because I'd gotten her a really good paying job at another city for this period. All I can really say is if you want to know somebody really well, you want to see somebody's true colors, live with them. Room with them for a while, you'll find out just how A, compatible you are with them as friends or more if it's like a relationship, and B, just kind of how they are on the regular. Our next story is from Curious Cratter, got revenge on an abuser. One Friday night, I went to a party. I talked about a girl I met on the beach while I was walking my dog. One girl was very drunk and said, is she fat? She doesn't usually fat shame people, but I invited her to softball and she was making a stupid joke. To which I said, no, she's chubby but cute. I like chubby girls. A guy, jerk, overheard me and thought I called his girlfriend fat. I don't know how such a big miscommunication could happen, but it did. I didn't know this. And two days later on Sunday, we had a softball game. I didn't play, but while walking out, jerk ran up to me, said my name, and swung at the side of my head and I went flying. Just for perspective, I'm 5'9", 115 pounds. Jerk worked out and was six feet or over and probably double my weight. My glasses broke, my tooth was chipped, etc. I was scared and didn't know what reason he'd punch me over as I never had interactions with him. I ran away, called the cops later. They're dragging their feet saying they can't find him, but I want the money for my damages. It's been six months. I even had an eyewitness go to the station and make a statement. I asked Jerk for the money and I said I don't want anything fancy, just my glasses replaced. Jerk said he'd give me an apology but no money, even though he did it in front of 15 people, so he's not denying he punched me. He's telling other people that I still call his girlfriend fat. He wasn't a part of that conversation, but five people who were all there say I didn't call his girlfriend fat or even talk about her, so that's only his opinion. So basically only he, of all the people there, think I called his girlfriend fat. He also admits hitting me, although he's told people it was open hand, even though many witnesses claim otherwise, and he still won't pay for the damages he caused. So, cue revenge time. I live in a US territory. This territory is not a fan of mainlanders coming in and acting like they own the place. Six months after the altercation, he started posting pro mainlander stuff and is trying to be the face of why mainlanders are good for the territory. 
also insulting a local journalist. So I knew there was a very strong movement against this, and after putting up his videos for a week, he got tons of hateful comments. So I messaged some of these people and gave them the police reports, chat logs, etc. And now he basically has an army of locals who hate outsiders trying to expose him. He also doesn't seem to be afraid, he has everything on his Facebook profile public. I've had a hunch and messaged his ex, she said he was abusive. So I have a lot of dirt to expose him with, except I'm just passing the information along to the people who want to do it. I think more than anything, this is a case of you do wrong by people, and people are going to be preying and scheming on your downfall in return. I mean, depending on how bad the stuff you did was. I mean, this guy's already preaching to a crowd that doesn't want to hear what they have to say. So not only do they already have a bad reputation, those people would probably love to weaponize whatever they can to discredit this guy, make this guy look worse, and maybe they'd even want to try to run them out of there. Our next story is from Swimming Bike 4019 grandfather's revenge of dumb rowdy teenagers i was told this story a couple of times this happened about 50 years ago some kids in town thought it was absolutely hilarious to drive their trucks and crash into everyone's trash cans on trash night obviously this would cause everyone's trash to go everywhere and cause a huge mess this happened once to grandpa and he was firm on it never happening again so the next week He put the trash can at the road and put several cinder blocks at the bottom and filled the rest of the trash can with water. Just for size comparison, these are those bulky big black trash cans that last forever. So he set his trap and waited. That night a loud bang was heard. The guy's truck was basically destroyed on impact. It never happened again. I've heard a variation of the story a number of times, even like more modern versions but it usually related to mailboxes and people going around with a baseball bat. A lot of stories where they would cement down or like reinforce with metal on these mailboxes and you would hear this ding in the middle of the night. Imagine the amount of shock that shoots up your hands in that situation. Our next story is from Jeep Hammer. Barbara finally gets what she gives, does it to herself. We'll call the couple Stu and Barbara. Barbara is a witch, literally. She took up some religion. They call themselves witches. Barbara love-bombed a very smart but socially inept friend of mine named Stuart. Stu is super quiet, super smart, an actual rocket scientist, and was smitten with Barbara. Barbara was smitten with Stu's house and money, etc. No amount of telling Stu would stop him. He was under Barbara's spell. She moved in with him, took over, cut off all of his friends, and gaslighted the crap out of him. Four years later, he sees the light time for Barbara to move out. She flat refuses. Stu has a very valuable china collection inherited from his great grandparents. Barbara's always wanted that china since the royal family somewhere has a set like it and Stu had to lock it up in a valuable safe since she breaks things when she doesn't get her way. When her eviction notice time was up, we helped pack up Barbara's crap, stack the boxes in the garage in her parking place, and change the house locks. Stuck around to see Barbara finally get the boot, the evil genius in our bunch got a bright idea. We took a bunch of warning, extremely fragile stickers from my shop, stuck them on the boxes and wrote Stu's China on the boxes with big black sharpie. Barbara comes out with her sister and another harpy slash witch friend, sees the boxes in the garage and blows up. An argument in the yard, she can't get in the house. She starts losing it. When she gets in her SUV, she sees the boxes again, backs up and rams them so hard, it broke through the wall into a storage room behind them. She's not done. She backs up and rams the boxes and wall again. We're already on the phone to the police and it's caught on the home surveillance camera. She rammed her own stuff. The cops weren't amused. They wanted to know why the boxes were mislabeled. We said we reused the boxes from Stu's original move-in since they were handy. One officer wasn't amused with Barbara, stayed to fill out reports, and actually laughed once it was all over. He's the one that said someone is an evil genius, that they wish they'd thought of this in their divorce since their wife burned and cut up virtually everything he owned. Barbara has since attempted to break into the garage or house three times in the past two weeks. The police have camera footage of it. What's left of her crap was delivered to a storage locker that one month's rent was paid on. And no, we didn't re-box any of it. It's in the same state she left it in the garage, drywall, wood splinters, insulation, and all. 
Stu is spending a lot of time with us catching up, trading insane ex stories, smiling more than I've seen since he met Barbara, and I couldn't care less where Barbara is, and I hope it's awful with her friends barking at the back door constantly. Well, considering the context OP gave us here, and how she acted after it was over, I think we can all agree that we're glad Stu saw the light, basically kicked them out and broke that off before it went way too far. At least it was gone, done, and over before it ever got to the point where they might have been legally entitled to half of his stuff. Our next story is from Alfie888, School Trip Cheater. A bit of backstory, I've been dating a girl for quite some time, and she went on a school trip to abroad. When I called her, she was always in a hurry to return to her new friend she met there. Once, it was that she borrowed vape from him and had to return it fast. Next, it was he's calling her to hurry up, etc. SoundCloud rapper. Top tier rappers in that country are trash, so you can only imagine the level he was on. Once she got back, I confronted her about it, and she denied it and told me to trust her. So I did. And she said that he's coming to our country in a few months and wanted to meet him with the group of friends they hung out with. I was okay with it because I trusted her and wanted her to be happy, so why not? But the voice at the back of my head was telling me that something ain't right. When she got back home, she posted an Instagram story saying, I miss you, and added me and her best friend at the time. I, for some reason, started overthinking about adding someone with a black text on a black background. Would you guess it? After 10 minutes of clicking on a black screen, his Instagram popped up. I confronted her again. She said she thought I would get angry, so she hit it. Never underestimate the power of overthinker. After two months, I got suspicious when I woke up around 2 a.m., and they just went on texting. So when she went to the bathroom in the morning, I got on her phone and found some photos she took with him, half-naked lying on a bed, her piggy-riding him, them hugging, and some other stuff. I sent everything to my phone. Now to the revenge, I told her that I want her to tell him that she doesn't want to meet anymore and that she's blocking him. She said no, so I confronted her for the last time with the pictures and told her to do it or we're over. After that, I told her mother that she should hear something and that she should just stand behind the door. I pretended to close it and asked her what really happened there. She finally confessed, telling me that she cheated with a too detailed story, and I felt like falling apart but held my composure and went for a cigarette. When I came back, her mother was yelling at her about how stupid she is and that she's not her daughter and some more stuff I can't remember. After that, I hooked up with a friend of hers that still hadn't forgotten that my now ex had taken her boyfriend in the past. I had probably the best night with her, with some long bedtime fun. She later texted her that she did say I'm good in bed, but darn, that was awesome. Not bragging here. My ex didn't take that well and started blowing up my phone. On the fifth attempt to call me, I told her friend to moan when I picked it up and she did. Then I blocked her number and never talked to her again. I felt pretty bad for a while when I found out she had a mental breakdown and started doing really bad in school. It's been quite a few years now and I can tell you, no regrets. I know it was a jerkish thing to do, but again, no regrets. I mean, as much as it sucks to feel like you might have been responsible for causing that mental breakdown, for causing them distress to the point where they started flunking in school, the fact of the matter is they were doing probably even worse stuff to you for a long period of time and just hoping that they could get away with it. Both when they were there visiting them and when they came back home, they were still sending pictures and chatting constantly. I mean, just imagine how devastating it is to see an Instagram post from what's supposed to be your girlfriend and it's an all black Instagram post so you assume they're tagging somebody with some black text that you just can't find. You prod around and boom, it just pops up somewhere. After all that, it's hard to feel bad at all for them having a mental breakdown when you sleep with their friend after the fact. And our final story of the day is from Funny Son. Mess with my go-kart brakes? I mess with your life. This happened a few weeks ago, but I finally got my revenge yesterday. So, you see, me and my two other friends went for karting a few weeks ago with our own go-karts. We each have a Rotax Max go-kart. It was our second to last race for the season. I was leading the championship, and my friends followed two and three. If I won this race, the three of us would be going to Italy to finish our karting career and go on to Formula Reno. 
My pace was out of this world this weekend, and it looked like I had won the championship before even the race started. My friend's father had a team that we're in, and he wasn't spearing any expenses. He got all of us a go-kart rig, a simulator, that'll help us improve. So the day before the race, we were practicing on the simulator, going through all the data and all of that stuff. We had left our go-karts outside because we were from practice rounds. There was someone, let's name him Bob, for this story. He was the dirtiest driver in the league, but his father had deep pockets and would always pay if his son was removed from the league. He was somehow in fifth in the championship and we didn't mind because he never used to disturb us, but this weekend was something we did not expect. When doing practice rounds, he used to slow down and wait for us to come and try to hit us off the track. Luckily, we were able to get through, but my friend got hit and broke his front axle. All heck broke loose. We stopped our carts at the side of the track where it was safe and rushed back to our friend to check on him. I was really mad at Bob and started arguing with him about his act and that he could have seriously hurt him. We left the scene and took our friend to the paramedics who were on site. We got him there and took our carts back to the tent that was for our team. I walked back and helped get my friend's cart from the barrier and took it and got it hooked to an ATV to be taken to be repaired. Now back to where we left, Bob came to where our team was and came to say sorry for what he'd done, but he had a smile on his face. But we didn't mind it, we pushed our cart back onto the track and went for qualifying. I didn't check if my go-kart was okay going through, if the gas worked, the brakes worked, we just went for qualifying. We started, and the first two corners you could take them flat out, no need to use the brakes. But when I came to the third corner going at around 100 kilometers per hour, or 62 miles per hour, I came to the braking point. But when I stepped on the brakes, nothing happened. I thought I was probably still stepping on the gas, because I usually had my foot on that pedal. So when I got out of the corner, I could get on the gas as fast as possible. I fully removed my leg from the gas and was fully stepping on the brakes, but nothing was happening. Nothing happened. By that time it was too late and I smashed into the barrier and my left hand was in some serious pain. The marshal that was next to me came running to the scene when it was safe and clear. He removed my safety belt, got me out and removed my helmet. He kept asking me questions, if I was okay, what happened, etc. The paramedics came onto the scene as soon as possible, put me on a stretcher, and I was then put in an ambulance and taken to the hospital. I had fractured my wrist and I won't be able to drive for 9-10 to weeks. My family pressed charges on Bob's family for attempted murder. We tried to get as much evidence for everything. My friend called me and told me that they had a lot of evidence from his GoPro that he had on his helmet. My friend who Bob crashed into. He left his helmet on the cart seat when it was outside, and his dad finished changing the axle. It took around 20 minutes. My cart was in front of his cart and was still recording. He forgot to turn it off. When re-watching the video from the GoPro, we got the part where he got a freaking garden pruner and cut the string used for the brakes, then went back to his team and then came to say sorry. Our lawyer said that we got enough evidence to show the court. Two days later, we go to court, and long story short, we won the case. Bob's international carting licenses were taken away, and it can't be given back. But this wasn't enough for me and my friend. I planned to destroy his axle, cut the brakes and gas, and destroy the radiator of his cart, and then put some Play-Doh in the cooling of his brakes, and never told a soul to this day. Oh yeah, I forgot to say that Bob was put in juvie for attempted murder. I wonder if the actual charge in this situation was legitimately attempted murder or if it was some kind of like lighter situation. I mean, I guess either way, bottom line, they're going to a juvenile program, so it's not ever really going to be that serious, right? And I guess we all know his father has deep pockets, so you can only imagine how effective any form of pressing charges is going to be against a family like that. But hey, maybe we would be lucky and Bob would end up being one of those kids that the rich parents just decide, you know what, they're too dumb to even bail out. I mean, if you're going to go and commit a crime where you might legitimately kill somebody by disabling the brakes on their go-kart, if you want any chance of getting away with it, you might want to turn off the literal video recorder strapped to your head. Bob is not only not the sharpest tool in the shed, 
but also a hardcore criminal, and I hope for Bob's sake that they can turn their life around and better themselves, but I doubt that's likely. But with that being said, that's all the time we have for today. Now, if you want to hear another absolutely crazy revenge story, check out that video on the left. Or, if you missed my latest video, check out the video on the right. That said, I'll see you all next time with some more stories.